Hi, my name is Eleanor Tatum, and I'm the publisher and editor-in-chief of the New York Amsterdam News. The coronavirus crisis has brought serious distress to local economies and advertising along with them. The New York Amsterdam News has partnered with the local media association during this unprecedented crisis. Help us continue our important work in chronicling the life of black New Yorkers and consider making a donation to the COVID-19 local news fund today. Go to givebutter.com slash Amsterdam News. Again, that is G-I-V-E-B-U-T-T-E-R dot com slash Amsterdam News. Thank you and stay safe. It's Thursday, July 23rd, and welcome to the New York Amsterdam News Podcast. I'm Cyril Josh Barker. On this week's episode, my guest is District 16 Congressman-elect Jamal Bowman. He's going to be speaking with me about his recent win during the New York primary election, the nation's racial reckoning, how the COVID-19 pandemic is being handled in Washington, and several other issues. Well, in June, Congressman-elect Jamal Bowman beat 30-year incumbent Elliot Engel during the primary election to represent New York's 16th district in the Bronx and Westchester County in Congress. The middle school principal won, taking over 55% of the vote. As he heads to Washington to take office in 2021, Bowman released his reconstruction agenda aimed at dismantling systematic racism by creating a reparations plan, transforming law enforcement and criminal justice, and pushing for historic levels of economic investment. And we welcome you to this episode of our podcast, and we're so happy and pleased to have Congressman-elect Jamal Bowman with us this week. I've actually been waiting for this interview for quite a while since he won his primary back in June, uh, beating out uh, 30-year incumbent Elliot Engel. Uh, he's certainly made an impact since his election uh, during the primary last month, and he has several ideas for what he wants to do to improve things, not just here in New York City, not just in the Bronx, but also uh, in the nation, and we're going to be talking to him about that here shortly. Well, it is Thursday, and the paper did come out, and I have several stories that I want to go over with you. First, our front page story, of course, this week is our coverage of the passing of civil rights legend Congressman John Lewis, who died at the age of 80 on July 17th from pancreatic cancer. We also have coverage in the paper about civil rights leader C.T. Vivian, who also died the same day uh, as Congressman John Lewis. We also have a story about what parents are doing as students prepare to go back to school in the fall. Uh, Many parents are sending their children back to class uh, as the COVID-19 pandemic continues, but there are several concerns. Uh, Some organizations are saying that the risk of COVID-19, of the COVID-19 pandemic, um, outweigh the benefits of having children return to school. And in our arts and entertainment section, we preview the virtual Broadway, We Will Breathe, a night of creative protest happening on YouTube. YouTube on July 29th. The online performance event will benefit several organizations, including the NAACP Legal Defense and Education Fund. And you can check out all of these stories. You can go pick up the paper on newsstands. All we ask is that you do it safely. Uh, or you can check out these stories online at AmsterdamNews.com. Just a quick note, we did ha- we do have a, a very nice picture uh, on the front cover of this week's newspaper of Congressman John Lewis as uh, the preparations are being made for his funeral, which will be taking place soon. Well, my guest this week is Congressman-elect Jamal Bowman, who recently won the 16th Congressional District seat during the New York primaries. He's with me to discuss his plans as he prepares to take office. Welcome to the podcast, Jamal. How are you? I'm well, sir. How are you? I'm doing good. Thank you so much. Well, first, thank you again for being on the podcast today. I was just saying at the top of the show that I had been looking forward to this for quite a while because your win is just so uh, monumental and important to everything that's going on right now. Uh, first and foremost, I want you to talk to us a little bit about your feelings about the, the passing of Congressman John Lewis. Uh, you're entering Congress uh, as he is making his transition, and I just want you to kind of talk a little bit about uh, his impact on America. I mean, John Lewis is the civil rights movement. I mean, everything the movement represents was embodied uh, by John Lewis. I mean, he was arrested well over 40 times. He was beaten, skull fracture, concussed, uh, but he kept going out there. He kept marching, he kept fighting, he kept protesting, and and protests that were rooted in nonviolence and rooted in peace and rooted in uh, equality and racial and economic justice. Uh, So he embodied all of that. And he was the conscience of Congress for a reason, because of those experiences. And, you know, I wouldn't be here uh, as a Democratic congressional elect if it weren't for 
uh, John Lewis. Uh, I stand on his shoulders. I stand on the shoulders of many others. And it's just, you know, it's, it's eerie to, you know, our, our race was called uh, on Friday, last Friday, and he passed away on the same day. So that's just eerie in and of itself. Mm. And uh, I hope to be a small percentage of, of the representative that he was uh, for our country. All right. Thank you. And I do want to talk about your primary win, uh, something uh, that made a lot of news. It was very important. You actually beat out a 30-year incumbent, Elliot Engel, uh, during the primary election. Take us through how you did it. Uh, did you know it was going to happen? What was your strategy on, on the win? So I, I want to start by saying I didn't do anything. Uh, it was a team that, you know, we were able to build from the very beginning you know, we launched on June 18th, uh, 2019, with the endorsement of the Justice Democrats. We were their first endorsement in New York since AOC, so it was huge to come out the gate, come out the gate with that level of support. And across the duration of the campaign, we, you know, were endorsed by 60 individuals in grassroots organizations, and we were able to build a diverse coalition to really connect with all parts of the district, building strong, deep, authentic relationships. And we started early and often by knocking on the doors of, of, of people who, who one may think are not the consistent voters, people who have been historically neglected. And because of that, they're historic, they've historically been disengaged. Uh, so we started uh, early and often to connect with them. And we wanted them to know that they were not just a part of this race and helping us get to victory, but we wanted them to be a part of our democracy going forward. And we wanted their voices to be centered as we draft policy uh, in Washington. Uh, so that's what it was. It was We had an amazing team, a diverse coalition. We connected with voters who had been ignored for quite some time. And that's how we were able to pull out the win. All right. Well, um, one of the things I definitely wanted to ask you about is that the 16th Congressional District here in New York is so diverse because you have Northern Bronx and then you have Westchester County, which are a lot of other smaller cities and towns. Uh, you have a very diverse uh, district when it comes to race, when it comes to age, uh, especially more so when it comes to income. You have different incomes living there. How are you able to reach everybody and make them feel like you were the, the right candidate for the job? You know, that's a great question. You know, so I want to say what I want to say about that is, you know, people who are white and wealthy care about racial and economic justice as well. You know, I think that's a that's a misperception that, that they don't. So, you know, when we uh, connected with people in those communities, we continue to send their racial and economic justice through the lens of environmental justice, fully funding our public schools. Uh, universal health care, a Green New Deal, and a federal jobs guarantee. So the people in those areas cared about those issues as well, while the people in the North Bronx, as well as Yonkers, Mount Vernon, and New Rochelle, were actually living with those issues, living with the issues of racial injustice and economic injustice on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, so that's what our campaign was all about, and that's why we were able to pull people in from across the district. And again, you know, I mentioned the diverse coalitions. We have volunteers and supporters of our campaign from every town and every part of the district. So that was also very helpful. And uh, yeah, that's how we were able to connect and, and really listen and learn and engage, right? So it's not just about telling people what, what your vision is or what you want to do. That's part of it. But it's also about listening and learning uh, so that you can bridge the gap between, you know, the North Bronx and places like Scarsdale, Bronxville, and Ron, New York. All right. And I want to go back a little bit because I think your story is, is so amazing. I think it's probably good enough to, to become a movie. Uh, you, you were a, a middle school principal. You're the principal of a school. You started a school, uh, in the Bronx and then you decided you wanted to get into politics. Take us through that journey. And I, and we talked earlier this week, but I want you to say it here now. Um, you know, every politician, every person that I know has an aha moment when they want to enter and to go into something. Uh, what was your moment that said, Hey, you know what? I need to get into public office. You know, I don't know if it's a moment. You know, I, I have to consolidate 20 years of public education experience uh, into a moment. I mean, that, that's just hard to do. It was just, you know, when you work within a school system that is under-resourced and underfunded, within communities that have been neglected, 
And despite your children, your students being brilliant and their families really caring about education, you know, not having the resources to support that growth and development was something that infuriated me throughout my 20 year career. And after working in the school system for nine years, I decided to organize parents and open up my own district public middle school uh, in the Bronx, uh, not a charter school, a district public middle school. And we opened and we served as a community school. You know, we were open seven days a week, offering a variety of programs to our kids and the extended community. But kids still had to go home into neighborhoods that were neglected and under-resourced. And my tipping point happened in 2017, 2018, when 34 children died within the K-12 school system in the Bronx and 17 died via suicide. And as an educator, you know, I understand the connection between trauma, poverty, and bad policy that was coming from Washington. So I just got to the point where I was like, you know, enough is enough. You know, I'm going to explore, run for office. The people seem to be yearning for change. And when you see the results of our election with triple voter turnout, uh, they, they, you know, they, they voted at the polls. They came out in support of us and we were able to pull out the victory. Wonderful. And I wanted to talk to you about the COVID-19 pandemic because you were elected uh, during the pandemic and you will actually be going to office as the pandemic continues. Um, what are your feelings about what's going on? And also, I just want to you know, make a mention that, you know, the Bronx has been hit very hard by the COVID-19 pandemic uh, when it comes not just to the health, but also economically. Um, tell me your feelings and your, your take on what's going on. Uh, what do you think? You know, it's horrifying, right? The federal response was unacceptable uh, from the very beginning. We did not enact the Defense Production Act early enough. um, So the resources that we needed uh, throughout the country, but particularly historically neglected communities, we did not have those resources. So we were scrambling to find PPEs to to, to enact or open up testing sites and to make sure our most vulnerable communities were were responded to accordingly. And, you know, in our district in New Rochelle, we had the second case of COVID in New York State. But because that was an upper middle class district, the response was swift and urgent and proper. We contained an area, we closed the schools, we brought in the National Guard to help with food distribution, and we opened up a testing site very quickly. It took Co-op City another 23 days to get a testing site, and it took Yonkers, Mount Vernon, and Northeast Bronx another 53 days to get a testing site. These are disproportionately black and brown communities, and Co-op City in particular was like the eighth hardest hit community in the entire city uh, with over 150 deaths. So it, it's, you know, the disproportionality in, in response aligns with the disproportionality of health outcomes in a black and brown communities because our communities are the ones that have been mostly ignored and neglected. And that's why we're running on the platform of universal health care through a single payer health care system to make sure everyone in this country has exemplary health care free at the point of delivery without copay. We are the wealthiest nation on earth. We should be able to get it done. All right. And also, you ran during the backdrop of the police killing of George Floyd in Minneapolis. Uh, After that, we saw several protests happening across the country here in New York City. I know that you also participated in some protests in in the district that you're now the uh, congressman-elect of. Uh, And you also have something called the Reconstruction Agenda that that I want you to talk about, because I think that's so important that you're bringing uh, this agenda to Washington to tell us about it. You know, we tried Reconstruction after the Civil War. Unfortunately, Abraham Lincoln was murdered and a racist uh, took over as president and he took our 40 acres away from us and gave it to the Confederate rebels who, uh, who were traitors of our country at that time. He also allowed the Homestead Act to give hundreds of thousands, millions of acres actually, uh, to white settlers, both native born and foreign born, and none of that capital was provided uh, to recently freed slaves. So we were freed, but we were left homeless uh, right after that freedom. The second reconstruction uh, was attempted after the civil rights movement. And unfortunately, at the same time, there was a, a war on drugs, quote unquote, and mass incarceration ensued. Uh, for this reconstruction, our reconstruction agenda is focusing on police brutality, mass incarceration, 
but also institutional racism in all its forms. And it includes a period of truth and reconciliation, similar to what happened in Rwanda and South Africa and Germany, uh, which will allow us to finally reckon with our history uh, as a country and reckon with the legacy of slavery and racism uh, in our country. It includes reparations and massive investment in black and brown communities. And it includes a shift from the over-militarization and over-policing of communities towards a new vision, a holistic vision of public safety and public health. So investing more in housing and, and food and and, and education and healthcare and environmental justice and a jobs guarantee and mental health supports. Uh, that's what provides true safety and security, not over policing and over militarization. And what are your feelings about President Trump's uh, decision to bring in those federal troops? We're seeing them in Portland. He's talking about bringing them to Chicago. He wants to bring them here in New York City. H how do you feel about that? President Trump is a fascist. He's a racist. He's one of the worst, if not the worst president in American history. And he's moving towards a, a presidency that, that is anchored in martial law. He's dangerous. Uh, and we need to do everything in our power to make sure he does not win in November. Um, so I disagree uh, with the federal government's aggressive hand there. I'm sure it's illegal. And I would like to see more mayors and governors push back on the inclusion of federal troops uh, on their streets, harassing and detaining peaceful protesters. And you mentioned uh, the election, of course, in November. I just want to make a quick note that you are actually running unopposed. There is no Republican uh, opponent in your race. So you are basically in there right now. You're going to be starting in uh, in uh, next year, in January 2021. Um Speaking of the election, have to talk about it in November. Uh, again, you, you're not running. You're, you don't have to run because, again, you're running unopposed, but the president does. He has to rerun again for reelection. Um, there's a very interesting movement going on right now. We've seen it in our streets. We're seeing it in the media. We're seeing it even in corporate America and some, ex to some extent. Uh, do you think that with everything that's going on right now that Trump can be defeated in November? Yes, I know he can be defeated but it's going to take all of us across this country to organize and, and make sure we do everything we can to get everyone out to vote. Uh, it's going to be different because we're in the middle of a pandemic. So, you know, we're hope we're, we're pushing support for mail-in ballots to make sure everyone gets their can get their vote in that way. And those who are going to the polls, we're pushing to have better investment and resources there. So people are now waiting on lines for two or three hours uh, but absolutely, uh, Trump can be defeated, but it's going to take all of us. So anyone listening to this, if you have family and friends in swing states like Florida, Virginia, Ohio, Michigan, uh, and other spaces, we need you to make sure that you help organize to get people out to vote. Because as I mentioned, President Trump is dangerous, and God forbid we have another four years of him. Uh, I can't even fathom what might happen if we continue to let this man occupy our White House. Uh, so, yes, he can be defeated. What's also key is flipping the Senate. So there are about five or six close senatorial races right now, Democrat versus Republican. And if Democrats can take back the Senate and own the White House, the Senate and the House of Representatives, uh, we can really push forward some urgent, bold uh, reform across this country. All right. Um, you have a very robust background when it comes to education. And I did want to ask you about that. Uh, now that you are in this position uh, in Congress, you're going to be going there in January. Uh, what changes or how do you want to improve education in this country? What, what are some of the real problems? Because I don't think people really have a clear concept of knowing unless they have children or if they're educators themselves. I think you running a school know what those problems are. Uh, how do you want to impact education here in America? Well, first of all, we, we can no longer look at education in isolation and our schools in isolation. They exist holistically within a community setting. So that's number one. Education, healthcare, community-based organizations, jobs all have to work uh, in an integrated fashion, in a holistic fashion. Number two, we really need to focus on early childhood education. That's from birth to age eight. We need to do everything in our power to make sure we, we provide families and children with nurturing environments so they don't have to deal with the disproportionate trauma related to poverty. Uh, this is where the economics comes in. 
Because if we can provide nurturing environments to every child in our country, they enter kindergarten ready to thrive because they didn't have to deal with disproportionate trauma. So early childhood, early childhood is key. Uh, universal child care is also key. And within the K-12 school system, we need progressive pedagogies in our schools. We need integrated schools, project-based learning, Reggio Emilia and Maria Montessori approaches and culturally responsive education so we can learn about each other from a cultural perspective, work together on projects aligned with the needs of the community as opposed to what we currently have now, which is a, a westernized curriculum rooted in myopic standardized tests which haven't closed the achievement gap and haven't given uh, our kids an educational experience where they can be fulfilled. And the last thing I want to say is we need to bring back the arts, music, physical education, and sports and theater so that we could develop our children holistically and focus on educating the whole child without taking a, a cognitive academic approach only. All right. And my final question for you is, what do you want to accomplish during your first 100 days in office? Man, first 100 days. So what's very important in this district uh, in particular is making sure that we have housing infrastructure, make sure our schools are fully uh, funded and make sure we can get people back to work. Uh, both within an infrastructure space, a healthcare space, and an education space. And then finally, uh, we need to make sure we provide uh, universal health care as we deal with this COVID pandemic. Uh, so that's what I'm going to be working on. It's a lot to do. Uh, it's not one thing. It's many things happening simultaneously. But this is the, the biggest crisis we've been in since the Great Depression. And we have to be bold. We have to be urgent. And we have to be ready for the task, uh, which I believe I am. So I'm looking forward to getting started. All right. Well, Congressman-elect, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. We really appreciate it. Yes, brother. Thank you so much. Have a good one. That concludes this week's podcast. You can pick up the latest edition of the New York Amsterdam News on newsstands and get updates online at AmsterdamNews.com. You can also keep up with us on Facebook at NY Amsterdam News and follow us on Twitter at NY Am News. I'm Cyril Josh Barker. Thanks for listening. Hi, my name is Eleanor Tatum, and I'm the publisher and editor-in-chief of the New York Amsterdam News. The coronavirus crisis has brought serious distress to local economies and advertising along with them. The New York Amsterdam News has partnered with the Local Media Association during this unprecedented crisis. Help us continue our important work in chronicling the life of Black New Yorkers and consider making a donation to the COVID-19 Local News Fund today. Go to givebutter.com slash Amsterdam News. Again, that is G-I-V-E-B-U-T-T-E-R dot com slash Amsterdam News. Thank you and stay safe.